This video introduces the two lines for ampersand strategy. It also uses the bottom up box rule arrow in. I think the best thing to do is just jump in and start the proof. Our argument has two premises and then the turnstile tells us that what's following is the conclusion and you can see that the conclusion is uh, is just about as long as the two premises combined. We have the proof set up here over on the side. Got our justification column. We know that at this point we always begin proofs by doing as many things as we can at the top first. Well, line 1 has an ampersand as its main connective. Let's break it up. So H arrow R and then on line 4 I'll write H. It's one ampersand out done twice. Okay, check off line one. Line two, it has an arrow as its main connective. If I had M and R on another line, I could write S. Well, obviously I don't have M and R, and I don't have the pieces to build it. Line three, if I had H on another line, I could write R. Ah, I do have H, so I get to write R. And that, of course, would be three, four. Arrow out. I could put a check by line 3. So one more look at line 2. Do I have M and R? Well I have R, but I don't have an M. Therefore I cannot do arrow out on line 2. 4 and 5 are uninteresting, so it looks like I'm stuck at the top. There's not a lot of thinking that goes into recognizing I'm stuck. I just I can't do anything on the lines that I've got. Since I'm stuck at the top, it's time to go to the bottom. What do I do when we go to the bottom? Notice we don't always immediately draw a box. Instead, we identify the main connective. In this case, the main connective is an ampersand. Since it's an ampersand, we will not be doing arrow in, and we will not be drawing a big box up above this. Instead, we're going to use this strategy that I call two lines for ampersand. This strategy is not a rule. It's a strategy. Strategies are things that we need to do on a regular basis and I think it's nice to give them a name so that we can talk about them. When you have an ampersand at the bottom of your proof, that really means that you have two things that you have to prove. We need to prove M arrow S and we also need to prove F arrow G arrow H. Moreover, what rule do we use to build ampersands, to build conjunctions? Well, of course, it's actually the top-down rule, ampersand in. If you're trying to build P ampersand Q, what do you have to have on two separate lines? Well, of course, P and Q. So thinking about this ampersand in rule, what we're doing is saying to ourselves, well, I need to have both of these things, and so I'm just going to take them both, and I'm going to pencil them in to the middle of my proof. I'm going to write M arrow S, right there in the middle. I'm going to take F arrow G arrow H and I'm going to write it down at the bottom. F arrow G arrow H. Why do I put them in these two peculiar places? Well, I really have two proofs to do. And so I'm going to put M arrow S in the middle and then leave myself space to prove it. And I'm going to put F arrow G arrow H H at the bottom and leave myself space to prove that. In effect, I'm doing two proofs. Once I've proved both of these, what will the justification over here be? Well, it's going to be ampersand in, of course, plus these two lines. Notice that these lines don't get justifications and they don't get line numbers. That's because they don't exist yet. Right now, they're both just goals. I've actually finished two lines for ampersand. All that this strategy involves is breaking up the conclusion and writing it the halves in the middle and at the bottom. Notice I have not made any boxes yet at all. Now my intention goes to M arrow S. What's its main connective? Ah, it's an arrow. Well since it's an arrow that means I have to do arrow in and that means I have to make a box. This box is going to go in the available space up above M arrow S. This box is not exactly straight, but uh, you get the idea. What's at the top of the box? M, of course. What's at the bottom of the box? 
S. We don't have to think, we just know immediately what goes there. Everything in front of the arrow at the top, everything after at the bottom. So over here, what's the justification for M? Well, every box starts with a PA. That stands for provisional assumption. And of course, we're making it for the rule arrow in, so it's good to put that in parentheses. Every time you set up a box, then you just go back up to the top and you look for things to do top down. So I just think through every line very slowly. Line two, if I had M and R, I could write S. Do I have M and R? As a matter of fact, I do. There's an M and there's an R. So time for me to do ampersand in and put them together. M ampersand R. 5, 6 ampersand in. And having done that, I have finished the box and I have proved S. That would be 2, 7. And the name of the rule, arrow L. Success. So line 9, that's going to be 6 through 8. And then the name of the rule, arrow in. Hey, fantastic. We're halfway done at this point. The box itself, it showed us that if we have M, we can get to S. And that's what this says. If you have M, then you get S. Now that we have proved that, our attention has to go to F arrow G arrow H. Its main connective is also an arrow. Well, that means we're making another box. And I put the box in here. And I know immediately that F is up at the top of the box and that G arrow H is down at the bottom. And every box starts with a PA, so this will be a PA for the rule arrow in. And that's line 10. Now, I need to get to G arrow H. One question, what about lines 6 through 8? Are those available to me? In fact, they're not. A very important principle about the use of boxes is that you can never use lines inside of a box to justify anything below that box. You can never use anything inside of a box to justify anything below it. So if you'd like, you can put a light X through this box just to remind ourselves that we shouldn't be making use of it. Okay, so if I'm going to make any progress, I'm going to have to use 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, and 10. Notice I sh probably should have checked off line 2 because I made use of it when I uh, did arrow out right here. Okay, so, well, is there anything I can do? Well, 4 and 5 are uninteresting. 1, 2, 3, they're all checked off. You can use them again, of course, but, you know, they don't look very useful in this case. And line 9 is available, but, you know, that's going to show up in my conclusion, so it's unlikely I'd be using that. In fact, I seem to be stuck again. Well, what do I do when I'm stuck? I go to the bottom. What's the current bottom? The current bottom is G or OH. That's why we make four-sided boxes and write in the goals at the bottom so that we know what we're after. Well, the main connective of G or OH is an arrow, so once again, I'm going to make another box. You know, we're working on the bottom up material right now, so it shouldn't be it shouldn't surprise you when you get stuck at the top. And whenever you're stuck at the top, you go to the bottom, look at the main connective, let it tell you what to do. If this had been an ampersand, we would do two lines for ampersand inside here. But since it's an arrow, we make another box. The top of the box is G. The bottom of the box is H. Yes, I know my handwriting gets worse as the letters get smaller. It's another provisional assumption for arrow in. Well, now we have the box set up. Our current goal is to get to H. Here's one of these cases that's so easy, it's tricky. I need to get to H. There's an H right up here. How am I going to get that H to show up? Turns out there's actually several different things that you can do. One, notice that the justification for H here is one ampersand out. Well, there's no reason I couldn't do that again. I could just say, here's line 12, and I'm going to write one ampersand out. It worked there. It can work down here. However, 
there are other things you can do. One fancy thing you can do is you could say G and H and you could do ampersand in, G ampersand H, and then you could do ampersand out and take it back out. But that's unnecessary. In fact, this really is a good opportunity to use the repetition rule. You'll remember that we've got this shortcut rule that I call R, or repetition, and it just says if you have P on a line in your proof, you can have P on another line in your proof. If we use repetition, oops, don't do that pencil. If we, no, I wanted that P there. Thank you. If we use repetition, what would the justification over here be? It would actually just be line 4 R. Repetition is useful primarily in these cases where we need for another line to show up inside of a box. But now I've proved that if you gave me G, I could get to H, thus I've proved G or H. So in line 13, what will the justification be? Well, the box above it goes from 11 to 12. So I'll put 11-12 and the name of the rule arrow in. Of course if I go up to line 11 I see yeah that was a PA for arrow in so I see I do have a nice correspondence here between the top of the box and the line below the box. Well having finished that that means I've also shown that if F is true G arrow H is true. So I can also call this line 14 and put in a justification and it will be 10 through 13 because that's the lines for this entire box and that's also arrow in and if I go up to line 10 I'll see that yeah in fact that was arrow in up there so they have the nice correspondence and now I'm done. What will the justification for the conclusion on 15 be? Well, when we did two lines for ampersand, we penciled in line 9 and 14. They didn't have line numbers before, but they do now. So all we have to write over here is 9. Got to find a way to get over there to write it. 9, comma 14, and then the name of the rule, ampersand in. And we're done. So, this is two lines for ampersand and arrow in. You put these two bottom up rule, this rule and this strategy together, and it's pretty powerful. It allows you to prove a lot of different things.